Have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? I have not. But it is, for Mrs. Long was just there, and she told me all about it. Probably an elderly bachelor with a King Charles Spaniel. Indeed, Mr. Bennett, do not you want to know who has taken it? You want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. Mrs. Long says that Netherfield has been taken by a young bachelor. A large fortune. Really? That he came down on Monday and was so delighted with it that he had to take possession before Michaelmas. Married or single? He might first inquire the gentleman's name, my dear. Bingley. But married or single? Single, my dear, to be sure. A single man of large fortune. Four or five thousand a year. <laughs> <laughs> it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered the rightful property of someone or others of their daughters. Oh dear. Hush, Lizzie. What if I think for our girl? How so? That he might marry one of us, Papa. And is that his design in settling here? Design? Nonsense! But it is not unusual that a young man may fall in love. But he must be a soldier in a red regimental jacket. <sighs> you must visit him as soon as he comes. I see no occasion for that. You and the girls may go, or send them by themselves, which perhaps might still be better, for you are as handsome as any of them, and Mr. Bingley might like you the best at the party. Well, I have had my share of beauty. But when a woman has five grown-up daughters of her own, she ought to give over ideas of her own attractions. In such cases, a woman has not often much beauty to think but of. But consider your daughters. And what an establishment would be for one of them. You must go. It will be impossible for us to visit him if you do not. You are over-scrupulous, surely. I'll send a few lines by you to assure you of my hearty consent of him marrying whichever he chooses. Mr. Bennett, you take delight in vexing me. You have no compassion on my poor nerves. My dear, I have high respect for your nerves. There are once my old friends. <laughs> you do not know what I suffer. But I hope that you'll get over it and live to see many men of 4,000 a year to come into the neighborhood. It will be no use to us if 20 such would come since we are not to visit. Depend upon it, my dear, when there are 20, I shall visit them all. <laughs> Despite his protestations, Paul was among the earliest of those who waited on Mr. Bingley. Captain Lydia? I hope Mr. Bingley will like it. We are not in a way to know what Mr. Bingley will like, since we are not to visit. It isn't fair, Papa. It really isn't. We forget that we shall meet him at the assemblies, and that Miss Long has promised to introduce him. I do not believe Mrs. Long will do any such thing. She has two nieces of her own, you know. And plain as cake, both of them. <laughs> She's a selfish, hypocritical woman, and I have no opinion of her. Indeed, but let us return to Mr. Bingley. And I say I am sick of Mr. Bingley! Well, I wish you had told me so earlier. If I had known that much this morning, I certainly wouldn't have called on him. Call on Call on him! Oh, Papa! Truly, Father! See now what an excellent father you have, girls. But I knew I should persuade you at last. Yes, I fear as I have actually already paid him the visit, there is no escaping his acquaintance now. Come, Darcy, I hate to see you standing about by yourself in this stupid manner. You had much better dance. You know how I didn't test it. Unless I am particularly acquainted with my partner. Your sister was presently engaged. There was not another woman in the room who would not be a punishment to me to stand up with. I would not be so fastidious as you are for a kingdom. I never met with so many pleasant girls in my life, and several uncommonly pretty. But your partner, the eldest Miss Bennet, is the only handsome girl in the room. Indeed. The most beautiful creature I ever beheld. Yet there is one of her sisters whom I dare say is very agreeable. Allow me to ask my partner to introduce you. She is tall, but that is insufficient to tempt me. Pray, return to Miss Bennet. You're wasting your time with me. See now what an excellent ball we have, Mr. Bennet. Jane is so admired. Bingley danced with her twice. The third he turned to Miss King, the fourth with Maria Lucas, but the fifth with Jane again, and at the same time. If you had any compassion for me, you would have half so. Also handsome, which young man should be, as if he can. It hardly expressed to you the shocking rudeness of Mr. Darcy. Then how wise of you not to try? I was very much flattered by his asking me to dance a second time. I did not expect such a compliment. I did not you? Compliments always seem to be by surprise. I'm sure Lizzie loses nothing by not suiting that Mr. Darcy's fancy, for he's a disagreeable, horrid man. But tall, my dear. Tolerably tall. 
You're a great deal too apt to like people in general, Jane. I swear, I've never heard you speak ill of a human being in my life. I would not wish to be hasty or censure anyone. Your Mr. Darcy is so high and, and conceited that there is no enduring him. And is he not handsome enough to dance with I, I detest the man. I always speak like him people with your good sense. To be so honestly blind to fall into the nonsense of others. Miss Bennett, would you perhaps consider a stroll about the room? Within a short walk of Longmore, that the family with whom we were particularly intimate. Sir William Lucas, formerly in trade at Meryton, had made a tolerable fortune and risen to the honor of knighthood. And gives two balls to see them. Lady Lucas is a good woman, and not too clever, which are quite restful. <laughs> and the daughter Charlotte is my particular friend. Oh, truly, Miss Assembly Ball was paradise to me. Occupied as you are to serve as Mr. Raymond's attentions to your sister, I think you do not suspect that you yourself have become a shall and say not of interest. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, all to my hearth and home. Well, what more charming amusement for young people than the dance, eh? I find it one of the first refinements of Polish societies. Any savage can dance, sir. Wit, sir, wit indeed. Do you notice that Mr. Darcy seems always on the fringe of the Mrs. Long, last night. And he sat with her for half an hour without once opening his lips. This baby's husband never speaks something like this. You wish the ball in idle chatter. No, Tim. He has an extremely critical eye. And if I do not begin by being in the end myself, that's what we're afraid of. Did you not think, Mr. Darcy? I expressed myself uncommonly well just now, when I was teasing Colonel Forster to give us a ball at Meryton. With great energy. But then, it is a subject which always makes a lady in the bed. <clears throat> now, Miss Eliza, why are you not dancing? Mr. Darcy, you cannot refuse to dance, I am sure, when <laughs> such beauty is before you. Indeed, sir. I have not the least intention of dancing. I entreat you not to suppose I move this way in order to thank for a part. Might I have your hand to the next, Miss Bennet? Mr. Darcy is all politeness, <clears throat> but I must deny myself the pleasure. Miss Bingley. Mr. Darcy, I can guess the subject of your reverie. I should imagine not. You are considering how insupportable it would be to spend many evenings in such society. And I am indeed quite of your opinion. La, once I wore a gown with twelve ribbons and a double rosette. <laughs> <laughs> the insipidity, the noise, the nothingness, and yet the self-importance of all these people. I would give to hear your strictures upon them, Mr. Darcy. Your conjecture is totally wrong, I assure you. Oh? I was merely meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes set in the face of a pretty woman can bestow. Truly? Pray tell which lady has the credit of inspiring such reflections. Miss Elizabeth Bent. Oh. Pray tell how long she has been such a favorite, and when I am to wish you joy. I should have expected as much. A lady's imagination is very rapid. Jumps from admiration to love to matrimony in a moment. Nay, I shall consider the matter as absolutely settled. <laughs> Indeed, you are a scamp and a rogue, Sir William, and you will make me laugh. <laughs> you will have a charming mother-in-law indeed. And have the pleasure of having her tenderly with you all. Mr. Bennet, you must hear what this mischievous fellow is saying. Pray forgive even the appearance of unwanted attention, but might I request this for you? Indeed, sir, it is rather an honor to request. The honor I believe to be mine. It seems Jane quite admires Mr. Bingley. No, this is the I agree. Bingley likes your sister, undoubtedly, but he may never do more than like her if she does not help him on. What she does help him on, as much as her nature will allow. Remember, Eliza, that he does not know Jane's disposition. Though they meet tolerably often, it is never for many hours together. Therefore, Jane must make the most of each moment she 